And the point of the series has been to bring together people from very different backgrounds, architects, designers, musicians, economists, even the chief economist for Bernie Sanders, um, and again, from different fields to rethink, literally, or even just to think, about um, issues around public value and public purpose. And I'm an economist, and for me at least, one of the reasons for founding and now directing the Institute is that it's quite striking that in economics, we literally don't have a word for public value. It's assumed that value occurs in businesses. And then different other types of organizations, whether they're public or civil society, can sort of nurture it, they can enable it. Especially a policymaker, they're just there to fix a problem when it arises. So we call that fixing market failures. So there's no real framework to talk about the co-creation and the co-shaping not only of markets, right, not just market fixing, but literally of value. And so the point of the series was to say, well, hold on a second, you know, growth under capitalism, which is recent, by the way, it's not a universal system, it's about 250 years old, has, you know, has not just a rate, but a direction. Where does that direction come from? How did we end up with big changes, whether it was the welfare state, massive social innovation, or the IT revolution, or what might become one day a serious green revolution? What are the different ways that different actors in the public space, in the private space, and the civil society space come together to make that happen? And design, which is the topic of tonight's uh, lecture by uh, an award-winning architect who will present in just a minute, um, is key to that, right? Because both the organizations are designed in particular ways. We have a word for this in the private sector. It's called corporate governance. It doesn't just happen. There's issues around design that happen. How do you design an organization? We tend not to think too much of that, unfortunately, in the public sector, but that's a, another lecture, which I won't bore you with. But also the relationships in society are designed themselves. And so we're extremely happy to have Jeremy Till here tonight. Um, and he's an award-winning architect, writer, and educator. He's head of Central St. Martin's, literally around the corner. You can walk there in five minutes. I think many of you did. Um, and um, a world-renowned arts and design college, as you know. Um, and he's also the Pro Vice Chancellor of University of the Arts in London. He's won all sorts of awards for his great books, and hopefully we'll be hearing about um, his research tonight. But it's, it's so important to talk about what you know, uh, Jeremy's talking about, which is design beyond the object, design beyond the sort of personal experience. What is it like to actually curate and actually design also that experiential and community and public value space? Um, and anyway, with no further ado, we will hear from Jeremy and I will be chairing the Q&A. And so please do bring your different perspectives to this. And welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. It's like Val Dunican, isn't it? Uh, you can just stand up if you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> I might start walking. I, I normally do. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm slightly nervous because for two reasons. First of all, I've never done this lecture before, and I, my lectures are normally kind of accretive and sort of add on to what I've done before. And secondly, because in the front row are some of my senior colleagues, and <laughs> I don't know whether they're here to flatter me or to judge me. I suspect knowing them the latter. Um, anyway, so the title of the lecture can get this thing going, is Design Beyond the Object. And what I want to start with is to, that's a not a good start. I think I'm going the wrong way, that's why. Yeah, it's, it's comforting. <laughs> is that your screen okay. <laughs> okay, right. What I want to talk about is design in an expanded field. But as is my wont, I start by looking at the opposite, which is design in a restricted field. And in particular, I just want to go through three ways in which the, the field of design is restricted. And I'm going to start with objects of design and the problematics which might be attached to that as an idea. So I'm going to start with a picture from our, our home. Um, our collection of ceramics, which Sarah's father started for us with a rather fine pot up the top um, by Hans Koper, um, worth a lot of money, uh, as it happens. Um, and then underneath that, so we tried to collect in his spirit is a, is a Korean potter called Kyung Lee, no, Kyung Ho Lee, 
And then up here is a fantastic piece from Bizem, which they make, they craft with these huge, great um, kilns, which they only fire twice a year, and it comes out in this sort of pattern. And then a slightly interesting and strange piece by Claire Twomey, which has a story attached to it, and this is the only story that you get from these objects. Because the rest of them, I'm going to go back to, that's a Liz Fritch, this is a Helen Beard, this is uh, Caroline Cole. And they're all made in different ways, and I can talk about them for a long time in terms of their aesthetics and their technique, their shape, and their beauty. What that kind of discourse about the objects of design does is, is to reduce the way that we can think about design. It reduces it down to a set of quite prescribed values of the aesthetic, of the technique, and possibly of a kind of functional use. And this you could trace back to uh, my voodoo person, Vitruvius, who is the first architectural theorist, who talks about commodity, firmness, and delight. Commodity, its use, firmness, how it's made, and delight, i.e. its kind of beauty and its aesthetic characteristics. And part of my, well, not part of, my whole kind of research has been based on unpicking these very restricted and very limited ways by which we can view design, whether it's architecture or the design of ceramics or whatever, in order to try to talk about a more expanded field. Because the, what the Vitruvian triad does is to detach design, whether it's a building or a pot or whatever, from its social and political and economic constitution because those terms generally are not talked about, the aesthetics, the technique, or even the functional use in terms of kind of abstract way, are not talked about in terms of, of a wider political or social discourse. And that, for me, is deeply problematic. And therefore, what happens within this thing, if you can only talk about it in terms of, 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 of objects of design in these terms of the aesthetic and, and these other characteristics, is that the, the other thing that happens to them then is that you can simply talk about the objects as commodities. And therefore, they become commodi commodified. And so this thing, the quote from Marx, the famous quote, it's an object outside of us, a thing by its property satisfies, and this is an important thing which I'll get back, the idea of human wants in some form or another. And so the sense that the object in its constitution, in its debate outside a kind of a, a deep social constitution becomes commodified. And in that, as we all know within neoclassical economics, we all know that neoclassical economics has no political constitution because it's logical, isn't it? It's part of the logical enlightenment project and therefore you detach economics it's a lie, we all know, but you detach economics from its political or social, which is why we are where we are. So that's my first bit about the restriction of um, looking at design simply in terms of objects. The second bit I want to talk about restriction is comes from a book I wrote with, with four others, three others, called The Design of Scarcity, in, in which we got a, a research grant to say, well, what does it mean to design in the age of scarcity? So the, the proposition was that we've moved into the age of scarcity. What does that mean for design? Uh, and we sort of kind of naively kicked off this project, thinking, well, there must be lots of theories of scarcity. And you looked around, and actually, there are very, very few theories of scarcity, which is an interesting thing in its own right. So there's not a kind of a really good unpicking of the, of the constitution of scarcity. And so we actually, as a group of architects, we had to do quite a lot of that unpicking to begin with. And so what we looked at is the way that design is completely complicit in the perpetuation of scarcities. And one of the ways that it does that is by holding out the promise that design can hold scarcity at bay whether it's scarcity of oil, can the technologies of an environment are going to hold that at bay. Whether it's you know, 
ridiculous things like, you know, we're even going to solve Brexit, apparently, by the promise of the design of technology, which is going to solve somehow, miraculously, the, the Northern Irish border problem, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So that what design does is hold out a promise which will perpetually keep scarcity at an arm's length. So this kind of sense, therefore, that we are, we are in the end going to be saved by design and through technology is a dangerous myth. Because, of course, what we see is, is that it doesn't deal with what has created the issue in the first place. What has created the issue of the shortage of oil is behavior and not a technical problem. And therefore, the, the, the argument becomes, as you see, that what you need to do is to look at the underlying constructions of scarcities and design within those constructions rather than the surface issues. And I think that this sort of sense of, um, of not dealing with the behavior, and you can see it, I mean, I could, I could have had any graph here, but you know, here is the graph of um, uh, carbon footprints uh, by diet type, and here is a graph of what is happening in the world in terms of, of where our diets are going. Yeah? Now, technology is not going to solve this as a problem. Behavior will. Behavior shifts will. And therefore, this sense that design is in some way holding out a promise that these things are going to be saved is something that we need to be really clear about. And the, Einstein, the famous Einstein quote, I think, is important in this because it suggests that we need to begin to shift the way that we look at design problems so that we're not just addressing the surface, because if you address the surface, you fall into Einstein's trap. You, you actually dig down in, into the depths of it. The next thing that we looked at, which is really kind of just with us the whole time, is the way that designers are complicit, and particularly within the commercial world, obviously, in the design of obsolescence. The obsolescence is necessary in order to keep the market in perpetual churn. And therefore, designers build obsolescence into systems with this result. Without the endless upgrades of your iPhone, you would, Apple would not be a, a trillion dollar company. They need to keep that. It's, um, it's an obvious, obvious point, this, but it's so obvious that it, you, kind of, you kind of forget it. And, you know, I, 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 I've actually moved away from Apple, but I will, te I will, I will reveal a truth which I, I did once actually look online at an Apple launch. I mean, why? Why, <laughs> why would you do that? Because what you're looking online at is your own obsolescence. So this sort of sense that, that, that this is being built in, and there's a, there's a fantastic project called the Restart Project, and they came to CSM. And, and what they do is, and there's, there's the Hewlett and Packard kill chip. The kill chip is built into Hewlett and Packard printers, apparently, because I'm on television. So I would just say, it is rumored. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a fact. It is rumored that there is built into printers a kill chip which kills the printer just when you're getting fed up with it because it's getting a bit splotchy, yeah? And you think, oh, well, I can't be bothered to get it mended. I'll get a new one. And what the Restart Project are doing here, they got a Russian hack to hack the, 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 this chip in the printer in order to bring it back to life. And here is a printer being... That, for me, is what design is about. Yeah, as opposed to the reverse. An, an earlier piece of research I did was on flexible housing with Tatiana Schneider, in which we looked at the way that, uh, particularly in the UK, that actually uh, houses are designed to be not flexible. They're designed to be obsolescent. So that across the top of a roof, which is actually quite useful space, potentially you go up into that, you know, loft conversions, is full up of truss rafters. Down the middle of this, this is five meters, so that, that's from here to there. You can span that quite easily. I mean, just, just so easily, you don't, don't even need new technology. And yet, in these houses, there's a low-bearing wall. So that in order to, to adjust the house, you have to take down low-bearing walls so the house falls down, unless you do structural engineering. And then anyone who's tried to muck around with the cavity wards to kind of 
just crazy technology. And so when we asked the, uh, the um, developers, why are they doing this? Yeah? Why are you actually purposely building in obsolescence? They looked at us. I mean, we, I was kind of younger then and, and sort of naive optimist coming in with a sort of left agenda. And so they, they despised us already before we'd even walked into the room. Um, uh, this is what they said. Flexible housing for developers is like turkeys voting for Christmas. And the reason for that is, is quite simple, is that you don't want people to adapt their houses because then they're staying in them. And if they stay in them, then the market is restricted. And the housing market depends on endless churn. So they're purposely building in, into the most expensive designed objects in the country, which is houses, they're purposely building in ob obsolescence as a form of, of, of control of the market in order to create scarcities. Because if you, if you could adapt those, then you could stay there when you're older, when your family moves out or moves in or grows or whatever. So that's the design of obsolescence. The next theme within this is the design of desire and how designers are complicit in the design of desire in order to feed the market in order to make things desirable so that that continues the cycle of consumption. Because if they're not desirable, then consumption is going to be restricted. One of my least favorite but most amazing slides is this. This is just, this is London, okay? This is London. We desire to live above the clouds and only people who are rich enough to live above the clouds can see each other. Down on the ground are poor people and dirt and real life and infrastructure and all the kind of mess of life. But oh no, we have created an image where you can desire to live above that and share this idealized world above the clouds with other desirable people. So this sense, even in that one image, of how desire is, is absolutely with us the whole time. I mean, it's so obvious, but... We are so close to it that we are blind to it at the same time, that we are sucked in, each of us individually, into the processes of desire which are constructed through design. And through that, the whole system of consumption, the whole system of, of the market is, is kept afloat. Now, this is a, I love this slide. I just found this. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. We used to be really happy with that. Yeah. And these things have sort of taken their own steroids and, and grown up, and they're still called minis. And has human society really shifted that much that, that in the 60s to there, we've actually doubled the size? And the impact of this, this, the impact of the kind of the manifestation of desire through these images is profound. Look at this next graph. This is a graph of, M, of, of miles per gallon. Yep. So you would expect that technology has actually made cars more efficient. And indeed it has. So from October 2007 up to October 2014, we were actually on quite a good curve. We were getting better the whole time. That has now flattened out. It's a tragedy. And it's flattened out because of the steroid effect of desire, of the growing of uh, the, the, the sense that we feel the need to have that next big bloated car. And, that, and the effects of that are very profound in relation to environmental and, and economic crises. So there are two books called The Objects of Desire. There's this one, it's got lots of pictures of desirable objects. And I recommend this one, <laughs> which is an untangling of the constructions of desire by this Adrian Forty, brilliant first book. And the final bit in this section is to do with the design of progress. And, the, and it's sort of wrapped up with the, with the, um, the design of, of desire. But this, this notion that, that designers have to, in some way, bring to the surface notions of progress. They have to manifest newness. They have to manifest that the world is moving on. And therefore, that is often done through new formalist tricks, new geometries, new materials, etc., etc., as a form of, of, of denoting progress. Most excruciatingly, this happens in architecture. 
I say excruciatingly because what happens is, is that the architecture is reduced down to image, i.e. it becomes an image of progress rather than actual progress. So I use this as an example, which is Santiago Calatrava's so-called Museum of Tomorrow in Rio de Janeiro, 40 million pounds worth of progress. And at the same time, you got this, which is the burning of the National Museum in Rio in the same city. So what constitutes progress here? The image of Santiago Calatrava or the desperate destruction because this is not seen to be progressive and therefore hasn't been maintained. They didn't put in the sprinkler systems and they allowed the things to collapse. So where is progress here is my question. Is progress simply bound up in an image of a, of a gratuitous form making or is progress actually to do potentially with a much deep rooted cultural issue which is manifested within the National Museum. And this is, this is this actually comes from a, a lecture Paul Mason gave, which he just says, okay, so we've moved, you know, this is the white heat of technology era of, of car washes where we've, you know, we're really using kind of technology and cars and imagery, and we've moved from that, as you note, to this, yeah. <laughs> and so we kind of, we've, we've sort of got a reverse progress going on. So the question, therefore, is, is that how do you design progress? What is, how do you... How do you engage with notions of progress beyond the notion of the progressive form or the progressive object? And that seems to me a much more important, and I'll get to that later, a much more important uh, mission than actually just coming up with objects which have a gratuitous aesthetic effect. That should be on a meme, shouldn't it? I think it should be the new meme, that one. Anyway, okay. <laughs> The final section is called the problems of design. Now, the famous definition of design is that it is a problem-solving activity. For reasons that will become apparent later, it's a definition which I think is completely wrong. But it is the definition by which design is so often described. One of the reasons I find it as a problematic is being in Central St. Martins, actually. Because our students don't see the world as a set of problems. Mm -hmm. They are optimists. They are radical transformers. They are disruptors. And if you just confront them with a problem, they just think that's miserable. And also, if you solve a problem, you're only making the world a slightly better place. You're just slightly shifting the status quo to polish it up in some way. And that, again, our students would feel, as you'll see later in the work that I show, is not beneath their dignity, but certainly not something which they, they find a kind of transformative practice, which is what they want to do. So let me just give an example of, of why there's a problem with the problem. This image people know, yeah? <laughs> so here we have a problem, yeah? We have people going to a gym and going up an escalator. Um, I am a designer, so what do I do? Uh, you know, I fix that problem and I put on no entry signs, yeah? And that's, that problem is fixed. A very simple, very direct <coughs> design problem. Now, I'm going to show you the obesity system map. So my no entry signs have solved the problem of obesity at a stroke, yeah? Now look at the obesity system map and walk around the obesity system map and see market price of food offerings, nutritional quality, rate of eating, portion size, de-skilling, tendency to graze, psychological ambivalence, and you understand that the problem is never isolated. It is always relational. And therefore... The problem takes the issue as an isolated event. And I put up my no entry sign, and I think I've done it. Whereas in fact, the problem is always related to another set of conditions. And that what the designer needs to do is to engage in the relational effect of those other conditions between each other. And this becomes much more complicated because you don't solve the problem. 
And this becomes a problem because designers sell themselves as the people who can solve problems. Therefore, if I'm saying, actually, you can't solve a problem, but you can deal with the condition, then you have to, a different value system comes into place. The other thing about a diagram like this and the designer's intervention into this is their intervention may be invisible. When I'll get to that later. And this is also creates a huge issue for designers because designers generally form their identity through their objects. If I say Eames to you, you say Eames chair. If I say Zaha Hadid to you, you say funny shaped building. If I say Thomas Heatherick to you, actually you might say Garden Bridge. No, so we won't. We'll move on from that one. Um, but the point is, is that the, the designer is, is identified through their objects, whether it's their building or their, or their thing. If you shift to a different modality of design, which is not the production of objects, but the intervention into processes, then those interventions may not have a mater immediate material effect. They almost certainly won't have an immediate aesthetic effect. And therefore, you have to re-describe the values of the designer. And in this, I would argue that we're beginning to move from the condition of the designer there to satisfy individual values and individual desires and individual promises, whether it's my Sarah and I ceramic thing, which I do adore, or your iPhone or whatever, into the designer operating in a much more complex but much more public and I would say much more a world full of agency in a much more profound manner. And then the other, the other, I, I, I think this, the best thing about diagrams is, is that they're always wrong because that you, you always need to intervene in them. But I quite like this diagram because it is so, it's so provocative that you, in a way, you have to go and redesign it. So this is the World Economic Forum um, risk interconnection map. It's kind of, it's the fan, they are really interesting to go and look at because you can see the way that the world is, is changing. So there, right in the center, was global governance failure. Here, we, we are actually moving into involuntary migration in social instability. State collapse has moved to one side. And in 2018, we're really into the area of migration, instability, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I only put this up to show, again, this kind of relational um, condition into which designers and policymakers and others need to intervene, and economists, of course. And I suppose that, that what this then does is, is to present a much more complex and problematic world, but I think it's the world which designers need to operate in. So, if I take the objects of design, then scarcity of design, and then the problems of design, the problem, i.e. as a solution, the scarcity is as design complicit in the construction of scarcity and the objects as the production of, of aesthetic, technical, and functional devices. The argument is, is that that leads to a restricted version of what design might be able to do. Whereas in my classic binary way, I will now reverse that and say, if I go beyond the object, beyond scarcity, beyond problems, then we will look at an expanded field. So I will go through, and this is, this is, there are no pictures in this bit, it's just text, I'm afraid. Right at the end, there are pictures. I, and I'll explain what I, why I did that. I, I didn't want to illustrate each of the points with, a, with an example, because that, that felt as if design was, was just limited to a kind of just one point. So let's go to the object, because I think the next slide is probably the, the, the killer slide for me. If designed objects, I'm going to do the bad PowerPoint thing, I'm going to read it out. If designed objects tend to be fixed, aestheticized, and commodified, so I've been through all those, out of time, there, sitting on my shelf, 
aestheticized, there sitting on my shelf, commodified. I told you how much, I didn't tell you how much the hands copa was, um, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying, yeah? Then design beyond the object is temporal, relational, and social. That my argument is, is that you have to understand design as a temporal act, that objects arrive in the world unformed, and are formed through their social use. That they are relational, i.e. that, going back to those complex graphs, that 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 object will be sitting, whether it's a mini, is also sitting within a kind of complex condition of environmental climate change. And social seems to be pretty obvious, but is sometimes forgotten. Now, there is lots of talk about user-centered design, et cetera, et cetera, and, and social design, et cetera, et cetera. But it is still, particularly in my field, which is architecture, dramatically underplayed as the primary context in which the discussion of architecture should take place as I will just about to explain here mm -hmm. in this book. So this book, you don't need to buy because I'm about to give you my 30 seconds on it. <laughs> um, the argument of the book is simple. Architecture depends on a whole set of things. This is just so damn obvious. It depends on a whole series of social, political cultural, personal, emotional, other forms of, of, of life. The argument goes then that these, these are so disruptive to the perfected model of the architect, of the heroic version, that what architecture does is to try to hold up the Holy Cross of Architecture with a capital A to banish these external forces. And then the final bit of the argument is they're going to come back to haunt you, so you might as well deal with them in the first instance. And so the, the book argues is to face up to a very simple home truth, which is architecture depends. So simple and obvious that no one else has ever said it, and I was really scared about saying it because it seemed so obvious. But from that, what are the implications of that in terms of what does that mean to the architect? And I, I will replace now the word architect with the word designer. If design depends on all this other stuff, don't see it as a threat, but see it as something which you work with and as an opportunity to, to gather together some of these forces in a, in a productive manner. Whereas within architecture and also within design, there is still notions of autonomy. There are still notions of the pure. There are still notions that we can detach ourselves from these other forces. So that's that. And so the first bit of Beyond the Object, so there's, there's six slides, six little lessons, is that, uh, and there's Leonard Cohen coming across, <coughs> a bit fast. Anyway, Leonard Cohen. I've forgotten what it says now. <laughs> there's a crack, there's a crack in everything. Oh, no, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. It's beautiful. So that sense of actually not attempting to achieve perfection and actually welcoming the light coming in and the light being a kind of a, a temporal and a, and a social thing is something which, which I argue for very strongly in my work about architecture, but I think transfers reasonably directly into the fields of design as well. Because it will, in the end, get buffeted it will in the end be exposed to contingencies. It will in the end be adaptive. So allow that to happen. And don't perpetuate the myth of the perfect. Related to that then is something I talked about before, which is why don't we talk about shift the conversation away from the objects of design into the consequences. And the consequences are what happens both before and after the production of the object. Now, in architecture, the whole history of architecture is told in static images of perfected buildings, generally empty, photographed at within a whisker 
of them being opened in order that imperfections have not crept in. I, the history of architecture is shown through the history of building as object, as perfected, atemporal, <coughs> asocial object. The history of design, to some extent, is also told through that way, and through whether it's the popular press, the magazines, or whatever, you know, the, the whole way in which design is, is, is done like that. It is not talked about in terms of the consequences. So if the consequences are both before, what's the supply chain been? What's the labor been? What's the environmental impact and footprint been? And then what happens afterwards? How's it been used? Does it have social purpose? Does it have public value? Does it engage in contingency? And so on and so forth. And this, therefore, opens up and expands the way that we might understand how design is valued and therefore conceived. This is picking up on this sense of, of actually breaking the mythology of, of, of the autonomous, of the autonomous object or the autonomous... I mean, it's a crazy, crazy notion that buildings could be autonomous. And yet there was a whole series of, of, of thought, very dominant thought in the 70s, which talked about the autonomous building in terms of, of the autonomy of architecture, to, tr to lift it out from all this kind of dirty, messy, contingent world. And therefore, it's lifting it from how it relates to itself and how you might analyze it on its own terms, whether it's linguistic terms or aesthetic terms or whatever, and, and actually how it relates to others, other objects, other, other, and this is a kind of Bruno Latour thing, but a kind of sense of both object and social networks in which design is, is placed within. And there's surprisingly little take up of, of, of that within, within uh, certainly in architectural theory, there's a bit more in design theory. And this is a, this is a Latour quote. So that if you just think about um, design as objects, then all you can talk about is objects as facts. They are this tall, they're this color, I began to do that. It was made in a kiln. How many times is that? Anyone listening? Every six months. Okay, so these are facts, yeah? I gave you some facts about the pot. I didn't give you very much about my concern for it. I didn't tell you about issues of concern, of how design, if you begin to talk about it as a matter of concern, shifts away immediately that you consider it. And I, th I really like this quote because, of course, what, what it also does then is to introduce an ethic. I, and my definition of ethic comes from, um, from Sigmund Bauman via Levinas, which is that ethics is the responsibility for the other. And the other is a whole baggage bag of, of stuff. And this is what this does. So the matter of concern also introduces that, that design has to engage in an ethical discourse which lifts it away from any notion of fact because ethics cannot be determined through factual procedure, in, in Bauman's version at least. They're always, they're always at play. And if we do that then, it goes back to my other point, is that then the, the whole kind of discourse of design then shifts from the material into these immaterial processes and how you engage within these immaterial processes. It may be after that you come back to the material, but you've gone down into this kind of immaterial world of processes, of, of social constitutions, of the politics, the economics, the environment, etc., etc., in order to understand the networks within which the object eventually is going to be placed. And then you come back out, as you'll see in the, in the, in the final set of slides, into how that may uh, be manifested as object or as design. Beyond scarcity. This is a question that we asked ourselves as, as part of the research project. Um, and it's a challenging one, uh, again, because of Adding more stuff to the world is how the designer leaves their mark on the world, whether it's the architect, 
adding a building or the design of adding an iPhone. And they identify through the production of more stuff. What happens then if you redistribute, whether it's, and this is not just stuff, that you're redistributing, it may be time. So, you know, time banking is, is a classic example of this, of, which it, for me, time banking is, is a design exercise. Um, and that, that through this, you actually begin to say, the designer has a different role, which I'm now repeating myself, because the role may not manifest itself through the physical object. It may manifest itself in other ways. But then that presents how, what then is the designer's identity becomes the question. This is also, I mean, I think we need to challenge the scarcity postulate full stop, actually. The scarcity postulate, I will read it out. Human needs are unlimited. Who says so? But this is what scarcity postulate says. But the means to satisfy these needs are limited. So this is the definition of, of, of the production of scarcity. But it depends on that first statement, human needs are unlimited. And we need to challenge that at the very <coughs> basic level in terms of economic growth, in terms of environmental destruction, etc., etc. But what then do we replace it with? Is it possible for society to challenge that scarcity postulate, which is overridingly determining in terms of some economic thought? I think you're going to pick me up on that, but let's we'll see about that. At the same time, then, we also need to, to rethink desire. Desire has become ensnared and entrapped within, within the systems of capital. Therefore, the only way that we can define our desire is, is, is through the consumption of more desirable objects. And therefore, desire gets framed in a very specific manner. Okay, there is other forms of desire I recognize in terms of love and emotion, but in terms of what I'm talking about, design and desire. And so the very simple question that we ask within the book is, how do we rescue desire from being ensnared within the system of capital and see <laughs> that actually we can desire different forms of exchange, we can desire different forms of action, we can desire change. And that is a simple thing for me to say, but a much more difficult thing for me to enact, or for any of us to enact. Then the next thing is to, to argue that if, I've argued that design is complicit in the construction of scarcity within the, within the capitalist model. But what we very quickly uncovered, and this comes from some of the few books on scarcity, is that scarcity is not inevitable, it is not natural, as, as the first paid economist, Malthus, argued, that it is always constructed. So I'll give you an example of that. The original affluent society. This comes from Marshall Salin's book, Stone Age Economics, in which he argues that the original affluent society was the aboriginal. They wanted for nothing. And yet, when the Western invaders came, they saw the aborigines living in conditions of lack. They lacked what Western society demanded they have, and so they needed to be civilized. And so that original affluent society was turned into a society which was, was ensnared by other forms of other value systems. And the tragedy which Marshall Salins talks about is that it again goes back to this kind of the scarcity postulate um, about we live in the perception of unlimited wants, but we're sad because we can never fulfill them. And therefore, you need to revisit back to the original affluent society and the values that might come out of that, is his argument. And the other quote is much longer, which is Marx's quote about houses, which is just to show quite simply how desire and scarcity are, are, are constructed. If you live in a small house surrounded by other small houses, you're fine. You desire for nothing more. If someone comes and builds a palace next door to you, then you feel, I forget what words are used, uncomfortable, dissatisfied, and cramped. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the construction is, is a social construction of scarcity rather than actual inevitable consequence, which is how it, it's too often seen. 
And so what, the, what we argue in the book is that rather than dealing with notions of, of, of lack, which is to do with um, that if, if, you, if you don't have enough oil, what you do is, is you put more insulation and so you use less oil. Yeah? That doesn't solve the underlying problem. That you need, to, you need to go into the construction of the original scarcity and intervene in those processes. And there's some examples of that within. And then the, the, the next final bit of the scarcity is, is the notion of, of redefining, of actually not taking for granted what is put in front of you. And there's a beautiful project here by Architecture Zero Zero. They were invited to, there's a school which have problems with their corridors are too narrow and therefore there's bullying in corridors and therefore that something needs to be done. And there was a three million pound project in which, in which architects were pitched saying, well, how do we solve this problem? Uh, and this is the classic solution, you have wider corridors and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> zero, zero solution, and that costs two million pounds. Zero, zero solution, they redefined the problem. And what they did was they changed the timetable so that the classes were staggered, so the, 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 the corridors. So the kind of redefinition, there's a, another example of that is, is Recetas Urbanas, Urban Recipes, a fantastic group in Spain, who, who do that by redefining the legislation so that he wanted to, he wanted to have a, a, a concert in a public square in a small town in, in um, Spain, but the um, legislation, urban legislation, said you couldn't have a concert in, in, the, in the square because of various things. But he found that he was allowed to put a skip into the square, mm -hmm. and you were allowed to stand on the skip. Mm -hmm. So he put the skip in. So he basically redefined the problem. And I think it's that kind of sense of designers now not just taking the problem at face value, but actually kind of splitting it up from the side and, and, and redefining it. And finally, but on problems. Two quotes. A professional is a man with an interest and continuing interest in the existence of problems. Problems are made by professionals in order that only they can solve them. There is a problem. I need to build a building. It's called, I am an architect. My problem is to build the building. Only I have the expertise to deliver that solution to the problem of the building. Therefore, the problem becomes self-defining and self-limiting. The second quote is just wonderful. I use it. Uh, it's a fantastic quote. All buildings are predictions. All predictions are wrong. All design are predictions. All design, all predictions are wrong. Now, sorry, I'll go back. So it goes out on your Twitter feed. Oh, no, I've gone too far back. Oh, dear. Oh, wait a minute. OK. So this sense, that it sort of goes back to the, this sense of, um, to this sense that, that design is a solution, is a, pro is, a, is a problem solving activity, and that we can solve it. And what Stuart Brand does is just to blow that out of the water, and therefore asks us to consider buildings or designs in other more contingent, more adaptable, and I think Brian Eno, who, who works with Stuart Brand, will maybe talk about this next week, this sense of actually what they call the long now, i.e. that you, you don't consider this kind of short-termism, but this kind of long sense that design evolves over time. So beyond problems, the, what I talk about in Architecture Depends is the sense of moving from problem-solving to sense-making. I, through my act, the first thing I try to do is try to make sense of these networks, of these collisions, of these difficulties, of these dependencies, and then to intervene within those. The second one is that generally the, 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 the standard kind of enlightenment model of, of, of the problem solving is a, is a linear system going through various hoops. Whereas what designers do, I think best of all, is always see things from the side rather than see things going down the line. And then also this sort of sense that the problem solving often just consolidates the underlying problem. It doesn't deal with the underlying problem, therefore it consolidates it. 
so that the putting more insulation into, into houses <coughs> does reduce the use of oil and car uh, fossil fuels, etc., etc., but it doesn't solve the underlying problem, which is our behaviour, which is our dependency on, on, on energy usage in that manner. And therefore, this word disrupting is often seen to be negative. I, I would say it's actually quite a positive word within this sense. So these all lead to this notion of design in an expanded field. And I now just want to end with some observations, first of all, about what that might mean to designers and to other people, and secondly, to show some work, because there have been a lot of words. Um, and I said I'd be 50 minutes, and I will be 55, 53 minutes. Anyway, there we go. Um, I'm interested in this, this I came up, this, this uh, little um, sentence I came up when I was writing about participation, because clearly part of what this series is about is the notion of public value, and public value can only be achieved through a sense of, of, of sharing, and a sense of mutual respect, and a sense where values are not determined from above, but actually are shared and constructed and evolved through, through a collaborative and um, democratic way of, of discourse. And that means that the designer or the architect or whatever has to take on a different role, that they are experts and don't throw away expertise, whatever Michael Gove says, but it was always framed, that expert, within their other role as citizen. And therefore, you, you have this dual aspect working together the whole way and the whole time. And this sense, therefore, that if you're going to be doing that, and it could be a, you know, a whole range of people, I think you can apply this little maxim too of the expert citizen and the citizen expert, that it could be across a whole range. And, and the other th beautiful thing about this as a, as a construction is that anyone can be, the parent, the cyclist, the young people, the old per older person, all of them have something to bring to the table in the construction of public value. And that should not be diminished. But to do that also, then you need different means of communication in order that their story has the same validity as my professional story and that can be surfaced and shared in the same way. So the older person is not a problem. It's a person with capacity. And the younger person is not naive. It's a person with insight. Now, I'm going to show this because... For me, this is a, a kind of turning point in my, in, in my uh, moments at, at St. St. Martin's. And it is relevant to what we're talking about. On the day of the referendum, when it was announced, this pitch was taken outside St. St. Martin's. What then happened was I switched on the six o'clock news and I saw this. The first people to protest against Brexit in public, in Parliament Square, was Central St. Martin's design students. That, for me, is really, really important because they saw this as absolutely tied into their whole identity and their <coughs> whole practice as designers. They saw absolutely that what Brexit was going to do was going to inflict on them a whole set of restrictions, some of which I talked about, and in that, shut down their agency and shut down their capacity to act as designers in an expanded field. And they you know, they got into mail online. I got I was quite jealous about that. So I, I wrote, I wrote a, a text to or, or to everybody that evening, which was then blogged within minutes, and then got me on the front page of the Daily Mail, which is one of the great things of my life, actually, as <laughs> as, as a traitor. Um, the reason I put this up, and so from that we then have evolved this project called Creative Unions. In, and the Creative Unions, very simple catchphrase is creativity must operate beyond borders. Social borders, economic borders, geographical borders, borders of race, borders of class, etc., etc. And this has become quite a, a kind of a sort of flag bearer for CSM as, as, as a marker of where our students are. I, I might have put the, the banner up, but I could only put the banner up because the work was already there. 
One of the beautiful things, I said this last night in the opening of the Creative Union show, which you're obviously all just going to run down to after my lecture, um, is I said is that the extraordinary thing about working in a place like St. Martin's is the immediacy of the manifestation of anxiety, the manifestation of concern, the manifestation of, of people's identities. So when the world is as disrupted as it is at the moment, we see that disruption coming through immediately within the student work. It's fabulous. And so what we need to do is to give them the, the frame and the confidence to allow that work to continue. So I will show very quickly to end up with some projects which begin to, I think, I hope, I haven't categorised them into those various bits, but you will see there are some continuities. Uh, but the, so this is Paolo's work, which took the thing, what happens if you redistribute what's already there, and I commissioned him to do our front room, which, which is this, which is just a, a piece of a beautiful design in which he's kind of re, reconsidering and remaking um, chairs from the Ten Boroughs of London. Ironically, this is a terrible story. Joe Johnson came to St. Martin's <laughs> to launch the white paper, and we sat him in this room, and he sort of... Joe, he's actually... Yeah, OK, won't go too far. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and he sat in the room, and our director of, of um, communications there, and Joe said, oh, these are very, very nice. I really quite like them. So they're now sitting in bloody Joe Johnson's office. The scarcity project, the irony of that is... So Frankie's project is just taking a day, a, a, a day of beachcombing for plastic and transforming it into jewellery. So these are people trying to... OK, they are manifesting it in the end through the making of work, but they're, they're doing it by engaging. This is an amazing project by Helen in which she's looking at uh, the Anthropocene and the effects of the Anthropocene and three pieces of textile design in which she's taking... Um, she, she hangs the, the, the threads in front of, of, of exhaust fumes and she wipes white vans and she then weaves the polluted threads into these flags and banners. And, so it's a, and there's one about plastic, one about air pollution and one about um, geological decay. And then they become these kind of protest banners which, which she takes on marches. And then foreign garbage. This stuff is almost impossible to recycle. And the MA Material Futures, Katie has come up with the method of recycling it. The beautiful thing that she's done is that she's recycled it into more useless objects <laughs> in order to make the point about the uselessness of the object in the first place. And there's, these, are, these are in the windows at St. Martin at the moment. It's a fantastic project. These two are a joint project in Material Futures and Art and Science uh, in which they're using biodesign, the earthworms going in and remediating mines in Wales, but in the process getting out what are called quantum dots, which are going to be used within technology. So it's a kind of really complex project of using science, using a, a problem of remediation, but being productive, working with unemployed miners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So not necessarily solving a problem, but kind of creating new opportunities. It won the Global Biodesign Award. This extraordinary project this year by Jen Keane, in which she's looking at, you know, supply chains and, and weaving and, and fashion, etc. Cetera, et cetera. She said, this just doesn't work. So she invents a loom, which she, she puts threads through. She then gets a certain type of bacteria, which weave their way through the, the, um, through the, the threaded loom, and in that, create a shoe. This is real. This is happening. She's got a patent on it. So this is, a, this is designed at a, in a way quite traditional because it comes out with a shoe, but in a way very untraditional because she's actually having to excavate the, the kind of right down into the processes and into the underlying situation of, of supply chains. And so this is bacteria weave woven shoe. It's extraordinary. Uh, I love this project, but no one else does. So this is fantastic. So this is a guy who just says, I'm going to make these, these... I'm not going to solve any problem at all. I'm just going to create objects which are unidentified, and then people can do what they want with them. 
It's beautiful. Then there's quite a lot of work about open source technology, about the way that technology is divisive, it is not available, and therefore this is an undergraduate student made a downloadable um, open source technology so that people can download it and make their own lathes from a very, very simple set of, of instructions. Sometimes though, design needs to be disruptive. It needs to actually... Yeah, yeah. Should I stop? I stop. One, one minute, okay. I do, I'll just show, I'll finish on this one because it's an amazing project. I love these projects. Oh. So this is Emma's project in which what she does is she takes Trump's tweets from the last however long and she writes 1984 with them. So down the middle is, it says 1984. And then she gets the first chapter in 1984 and she writes it with Trump's tweets. Mm -hmm. There are some words, sanguine, a bit long for Trump, so that doesn't exist in Trump's tweets. But <laughs> the, point, the point is, is how amazingly similar, you know, Trump's tweets are to the language of 1984. And I think we probably can end on that point there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to chair the discussion, and I will take uh, chair's prerogative and ask the first question, if that's okay. So you began with the, um, the issue, well, it was one of your first slides around obesity. And I was kind of struck that those kinds of big changes in, in behaviors that you alluded to, which of course are fundamental to also getting us the kind of green direction that many cities are trying to have, that in the end, you didn't, I mean, as great as the, as the talk was, I, I kept kind of waiting for some sort of understanding also where you're thinking in terms of where the collective actions happen in terms of design, whether that's through movement. We have Charlie Ledbetter actually working with us in the Institute thinking about the movements behind some of the mission-oriented stuff we're doing, you know, so both the birth control pill and the AIDS um, you know, drug actually came from social movements fighting for it, but where is kind of the movements around how you think about design, but of course also policy, I mean, big behavioral changes, including suburbanization, which in a way was a design issue. People didn't just wake up and go to the suburbs. That actually came out of policy, which Carlota Perez, who's an honorary uh, professor with us, um, talks about as the way that actually mass production ended up getting fully diffused and deployed throughout the economy. Without suburbanization, we wouldn't have had the potential for mass production to have the effect it did. So where are movements and where is policy in your understanding of how design can work in the ways that you were talking about, which is actually okay. outside of the box? No, I think that's a key question, because, which I didn't address. <coughs> so I will, I will answer it by an example, which is how we are working with London Borough of Camden on their policy mm -hmm. and on their, um, their challenges over, over budgets and on, on various service provisions. We had a really interesting meeting with Camden to kept the thing going, which was a workshop in which they brought around the table a guy from finance and someone from environment and someone from uh, um, housing and someone from waste disposal and someone from there and there, there, there and some designers. And we, the exercise we set is what, what, how, how do we deal with the problem of recycling? Yep. Take off of recycling. And each of them came up with their own very isolated and completely disconnected yeah. solution. The finance guy said, well, we have to incentivize it through money. The, the waste people said we need bigger bins. The housing people said um, we've got to get the bin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there was no linking up. What the designers were able to do was to go in, intervene, and say, "What well, if there was a communication thing coming through the housing, which then joined up with there, and that, and therefore it was a relational thing where the designers were able to intervene in what in these little pockets of each well-meaning pockets, but the designer was able, in a relational and connective way, to join up the bits and say, well, if you did this, then. Yeah. That, and that, really so, so it's yeah. that sort of approach, which, I so it's not the production necessarily of a new recycling bin, which yeah. might have been the answer, it's, it's the production of, of new systems and processes, which yeah. I think designers can understand. And getting that what-if moment to be yeah. understood through yeah. Last question from my side, and I'm going to open up is, and, I, and I've asked this to many of the architects who've also come to talk to us, sorry, other architects, including Richard Rogers and Amanda Levitt, which was, you know, 
in, in economics somehow, when we disagree with what's happening, we've also tried to communicate our issues, for example, around austerity to the wider public. So we don't just write in our economics journals, which are you know, kind of boring. We also try, at least, to write in either The Guardian or the FT or even in the Daily Mail to get our opinions across around why things are wrong and how they're being thought about in terms of framing. To what degree today uh, is, is the kind of thinking that you are kind of advocating also being communicated to the wider public? I mean, the word austerity, you know, in recent years is kind of a household word. People either are for or against, but it was a word that economists kind of got out there in terms of think, you know, trying to get the wider public to understand that issue. What are the words, do you think, or what are the topics that have been communicated around these issues to the wider public? And is there sort of a, a selling out? So the architect's answer was, we can't because we work on commission and, and you know, we're going to get our uh, <laughs> clients not no, to hire us if we make it. That's yeah. a complete, so well, I mean, that's because designers? with greatest respect that some of the architects, the, the architectural discourse is so focused on the production of freshness and of newness and that's what you read about and therefore it's very difficult for any other value system, for an architect to talk about any other value system. The hope is, is that then, is when, let's say, Assemble win the Turner Prize or when community housing trusts involved interesting architects in Zurich to design co-owned spaces in a certain manner, then you shift how architecture is, is understood. And I think that's, that's what we need to get to. We need to get to a very basic thing that design is about, well, let's start with architecture. My very simple thing is that is a Lefebvrean thing, which is design is about the production of social relationships. Yeah. Spatial relationships lead to social relationships. And therefore, if you're talking about social relationships, that's, that's what we have to keep on talking about. And design can do wonderful things about, the, about reimagining social relationships. However, as long as design is simply framed within a discourse of beauty, of aesthetics, of freshness, of newness, of Sunday supplements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then we're never going to break out of that. But who are the designers today who are even writing the op-eds, trying to get, again, people to be thinking? Well, I think that actually... The one, I mean, just one op-ed that you can remember in the last... Well, I think what Ollie Wainwright's doing yeah. within The Guardian is, is really yeah. strong, because Ollie, okay. Ollie does long pieces about the economics of land. Mm. Now, he's their design critic. And what we've done at St. St. Martin's is, with Mel Dodd and, and Ollie chairing it, is, is two series of things called fundamentals in which, in a design school, we are talking about fundamentals. We're talking about land, we're talking about planning, we're talking about jobs, we're talking about all these things as, as, as a kind of underlying platform on which then designers and citizens have to kind of move around on. Great, so I'm going to take three questions at a time. Um, so do you need a pen and a paper to write them down? Could, um, I think that's an instruction, it's not a question. A <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're like me, you have to write them down. So, can I see hands? Okay. Can you lend a pen and paper? Hi. Um, Sorry, I have to keep mine in case. <laughs> I was... Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I really liked your, your line about the expert as citizen and the citizen expert. Um, and it made me wonder if, um, if you take it uh, further, is design beyond the object also design beyond the designer, or at least the designer as the kind of uh, the professional? Um, yeah. And then if that is so, um, is it feasible that designers will design themselves out of a job? Mm. Okay. Good question. Yeah. I have an answer. Oh, you have to wait. Okay. <laughs> in the back. Thanks. I've got a related. Oh, sorry. I should have oh. said. Could everyone just identify themselves? Could you just tell us your quick name uh, and who you are? Josh Gardner Rose from Public Access. Awesome. Uh, Connor Maloney from Queen Mary. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a related point actually, which is uh, to intervene in social relations, one needs a social understanding. Um, so if you. If our architects are going around, you know, equipping themselves in social sciences, you know, by exclusion, they're they're then not equipping them themselves with the things that society will call on them to to do, and you know, and we see, you know, we can, we know how architects get de-skilled and how architects are de-skilled, and um, so yeah, what happens 
when we do need things to be made, and we need them to be made beautifully and skillfully, and yeah, okay. consciously. Right. One more question, then we'll take another three after this from Chancery. Um, this is my interpretation. Name of and oh, name. sorry, yeah, David David Guile, um, UCL Institute of Education. This is my interpretation of one of the arguments I think that's running through your really interesting uh, presentation, that you've moved from operating and thinking and practicing in the field of restricted practice to the expanded practice. I just wonder whether you've given any thought to what are the implications of professional formation for the architects of the future if they're going to work in that, that field. And I just want to leave one small thought. Do they need a bit of operating in the, ex in the restricted field before they can move <laughs> or, or, or not? Okay, so they're in a way all kind of joined up questions. Um, let me start with another of my favorite quotes, which is from the um, f feminist philosopher Gillian Rose, uh, who right at the end of her life got interested in community architecture. I don't know why, but she did. And the quote goes, and this is when community architects was really kind of ideological, that all the architect was allowed to do was push the pencil around driven by the, by the community, because any form of, of knowledge is a form of power, therefore just strip that out. All you're there for is, to, is a pencil pusher, yeah? technical enabler, nothing else. The power is, is with the people. And Julian Rose's quote is, the architect was demoted, but the people did not accede to power. Okay. And so what she's arguing is, is sort of what you're all arguing is, what happens if, if you divest yourself of knowledge? And I'm absolutely not arguing for that. I'm arguing that that knowledge is a mutual, in Giddens' terms, is a mutual knowledge in which, which someone else's knowledge has the same validity and value as, as my knowledge. But you don't divest yourself, to answer your question very directly, of, the, of, of, of your knowledge. You bring that to the table, but you allow other forms of knowledge also to be collected around the table. In terms of yours, I don't think you need to be a social scientist to understand social relations. I think what social scientist probably does is to instrumentalize and to prescribe and to, and to put into forms of knowledge social relations. I'm not sure that you need to do that in order to engage in a social discourse. So I think that you can approach that with a sensitivity to these issues, but without having necessarily expertise in it. In terms of the, the, both of those questions, then, is, is, is it, it, I, I haven't really answered. I think it's an incredibly important question, is, is this thing about a kind of core skill versus you know, the T-shaped diagram, the core skill versus the, the, um, the expanded one. How much, what, what is the architect, what is the core of the architect's skill and knowledge base which you shouldn't throw away? And for me, what architects in particular are good at is the understanding of the relationship of spatial relations to social relations. They understand, if they are sensitive to it, that if that is that high, it does something to the way that I address the audience. If it's that high, it does something else, even at that level. So I would say that that is a, a core skill, which is, which is beyond simply the production of beauty. And I, th I, think you're, I, I think you're dead right to ask the question, because it, it needs to be kept in the air the whole time, because otherwise you might just become second-rate social scientists mm -hmm. or second-rate artists or second-rate whatever, and that that would be a tragedy. Um, in terms of what does it mean for the profession? Well, when I'm naughty, I'd say the profession doesn't exist anymore anyway, mm -hmm. because it's been so marginalised, because we have allowed it to be taken over by the other architecture this is by the other professionals, whether it's project managers or whatever, and therefore the profession has basically been marginalised down to a very limited scope of dressing up the hard fist of capital in velvet gloves. And therefore, are we actually, is, is there anything remaining as a kernel of, of professional activity? That's when I'm feeling naughty, and therefore is protection title even worthwhile? 
where I get optimistic is, is I, have to, I have to be an optimist because I'm an educator, is the next generation who are in, in certain schools are being taught, educated and, and um, developed in this expanded field and, and mm -hmm. they are going out and operating in expanded ways. So are you at Sheffield where Sarah and I were both professors? We did quite, I think, quite a radical move in terms of architecture education, education. And now we see our students in public practice. You know, I don't know if they are, but they are in, in different roles as, as enablers, as spatial enablers. So I think that that, for me, is, is, is quite positive. The world doesn't really need that many more architects anyway. They need more, they need more what, in another book, I call spatial agents. How much do you think that this also impacts, say, how business schools think? So, you know, the other great quote by Marx was the one about the spider web. He said, you know, if you look at a spider web, it is literally the best designed object you can think of. And then you look at these crappy little houses made by architects, especially in Italy, we call them geometry. So they don't even have an architecture degree, but they make houses along the coast. Um, why is the geometra, you know, the crappy architect, superior to the spider? Because he or she actually thought about what they were doing before they did it. They actually had strategy. And so if you take that kind of you know, important point of Marx and how humans differ from spiders in terms of thinking ahead and then building something, and then strategy is in some ways a concept, a modern way that we talk about that, how would this also affect how we think about sort of modern day strategy? So beyond also design in terms well, of, I mean, to what degree has strategy itself been I mean, as long as, modern day, as long as modern day strategies in business schools are taught in the context of of the bottom line of, of shareholder value, we're pretty scuppered anyway. So that we're, there's, there's no all you can do is is to kind of realign strategy in a in a fairly mundane manner. They think it's, it's radical, brand. yeah, it, and in, in order to deliver forms of shareholder value, which is why we set up an MBA at St Saint Martins for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. So we 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 set up the MBA at St Saint Martins in order to disrupt the value system by which most MBAs are run. Uh, surprise, surprise, we've shifted. Well, just one simple thing about the course. Uh, the gender demographic is reversed. We've got 75% women on the course. Mm -hmm. Because the, if you introduce different forms of value into the discussion of an MBA, then different kind of demographics are attracted to it. Great, so three more, especially some women. We've only had some men questions. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll have to pick on people. <laughs> Come on. So normally Reiner, ask, ask a question. He's a, he's a boy, <laughs> but I can pick on him because I know him well. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, d sorry, I didn't see you. Yep. I picked on him. Hi, I'm uh, Katie I'm from uh, Publica. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about uh, the construction of um, scarcity and how you like how designs are complicit in it. Um, mentioned how what you think about the impact of the global society and how you're talking about the Aboriginal society being closed off from others and then being introduced to other societies what effect do you think the like global communications is having upon our like perception of scarcity and our um, our ability to desire more than we can actually achieve <laughs> You can ask her again. <laughs> Any more questions on this side? Yeah. Reiner? Yeah, and then we'll close anyway because we're, we're not the finishing team. Yes, yeah, a question and wrapped in a comment, I guess, or, or the other way around. Um, as, as you know, Walter Benjamin has this very short but very pointy text about capitalism being a religion. And in many ways, what you today talked about is, is that designers need to be her heretics of capitalism. On, on the other hand, aren't heretics always making the religion actually stronger? So if you have these beautiful objects coming out of St. St. Martins, won't they actually make the, in the high street even strong, you know, more strongly consumerism and all, consumers and all that objectified? And so there is an, you know, hereticism is very nice, marginalized uh, thing to have. It's like icing on a cake almost. I would put it. So how do you systematize it? Exactly, yeah. Uh, I think I disagree with you, actually, because I think that, that 
in many cases, the, the work coming out of St. Martin's might have a kind of, it has a, a rigor and precision to it, which may manifest itself as a form of beauty. But it's not, the object of the, of the, of the project is not the creation of beauty. It's the manifestation of other, of other things. And if, if one of the ways, so that if you take um, the project of, of plastic waste and turn it into jewelry, that is, is, it's a very conscious decision of, of kind of the, the redemption of waste into something which is beautiful in order to, to, to address that thing. I don't, I, I'd have to ask my colleagues, but I don't think it's so it's about process. Yeah, I mean, I, we yeah. say the same thing about commercialization, that yeah. one thing is about obsessing about commercialization, another thing is for commercialization to be a spillover of yeah. trying to solve a problem like going to the moon. Yeah. And I think the answer to your question, you, you, I think you did answer it, because in the hysteria of global communication and in the un, un, mass kind of the lack of control of global communication, yes, you could imagine that scarcities are being exaggerated and exacerbated and perpetuated and kind of disseminated so widely. You know, the, it, in images of desire through YouTubers and Instagram accounts, et cetera, et cetera, are yeah, pretty obviously dominant. On the other side, you could argue that the kind of movements of, of, of relational communication of people being gathered together in activist groups, in disruptive groups, are, is actually quite a positive side of it. So, do, and we see that being played out, and that kind of you know, dualism being played out on a daily basis between, and, and, and you might say that's one of the reasons that we're in this kind of incredibly binary world. That on the one hand we have the the, you know, the, the absolute proliferation of, of of the image, which is the production of involving production of scarcity, against the proliferation of activism and and dissent and et cetera, et cetera, both happening within the same digital space. So I, 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 I think the jury's out, actually. Okay, well, thanks. That's 8 o'clock on the dot. And as you know, we have a wonderful bar outside where you can all buy yourselves a drink. But let's all thank Jeremy for a wonderful... <laughs>